This is our beautiful home at night. But it took well over a hundred years for our planet to look like this. You see, the first light bulb began to shine 134 years ago. Before then, our planet was plunged in relative darkness. Today, these light bulbs capture the industrial heartbeat of our planet. But what if our world were lit up by information instead of light bulbs. What would that pulse look like? Well, here's a visualization of our world lit up by information, literally lit up by tweets. Now, the first tweet began to shine just short, seven short years ago. And that's incredible because these two maps already look incredibly similar. You have this one, 134 years in the making, compared to this one, produced in just seven years. This is why they call it an information revolution. And in fact, this particular map only displays 3% of all tweets posted in real time. These social media networks are forming a new nervous system for our planet capturing the pulse of our societies in real time. Now, what if our world were lit up by human connections? Well, here's a global map of all friendship connections on Facebook. There are famously only six degrees of separation between any two of us on this planet. Well, on social media, that figure drops closer to four. But now, what does any of this have to do with digital humanitarians? Well, social media is increasingly used to communicate during crises. Take the case of Hurricane Sandy, for example. Over 20 million tweets, 20 million tweets were posted during that hurricane in just a matter of days. And this here is not a weather map of the hurricane at the time. It's a mood map based on tweets posted during that hurricane. The redder colors denote sort of negative sentiment, while the brighter colors are more positive emotions. Social media networks are forming a new nervous system for our planet, and this has important consequences for disaster response. But of all these hundreds of thousands of tweets, these millions of tweets posted during disasters, what, what percentage do you think are actually relevant, informative, actionable for disaster responders. Now here's some shouting out, maybe 1%? 3%, do I hear 4%? <laughs> 5, 10? Well, it, it differs from disaster to disaster and from country to country. In Australia, during the major bushfires they had a few years back, 65% of tweets posted were directly relevant for disaster responders included potentially life-saving information. And let's just assume hypothetically for a minute that only 8% of all of those tweets posted during Hurricane Sandy were relevant and informative for disaster response. There were 20 million tweets posted. That's 1.6 million tweets, relevant, timely information shared during that particular disaster. And we're not only talking about Twitter when it comes to social media. In fact, at last count, there are 38 distinct social media channels. Take Instagram, for example. Dur during Hurricane Sandy, over half a million Instagram pictures were taken, posted, and shared on social media. Now, all of this represents a volume and velocity of information that traditional humanitarian organizations are simply completely unprepared and incapable of managing at this point in time. Now, just how unprepared are they? Well, let's assume that uh, Stay Puff Marshmallow Man here <laughs> is big data. How are responders, humanitarians, responding to this avalanche of information? They're running for it. They're not prepared to deal with this information. And big data here presents two major challenges. Obviously, the first is volume, right? But when you're talking about da big data generated from social media, user-generated content, 
during disasters, what about the reliability of that information? Is that information, in fact, trustworthy? So now talk about how digital humanitarians are tackling these two fundamental challenges in disaster response. Let's start with the big crisis data. And let's start in the Philippines. You may remember a few months ago, a devastating typhoon hit the country. Within about 48 hours of the typhoon making landfall, the United Nations activated the Digital Humanitarian Network in order to carry out a rapid damage assessment of the disaster to inform the relief operations on the ground. Now, the Digital Humanitarian Network is a network composed of the biggest superheroes in digital humanitarian response. You can consider them the, the ghostbusters of big data. And they're all volunteers. And this network serves as the official interface between the established traditional humanitarian organizations who, for the most part, have no idea how to use these new technologies and matches them with these very agile, capable, digital volunteers from all around the world. But the task that they gave us in response to the Philippines was virtually an impossible, impossible task. You see, what they wanted us to do was collect all the tweets that had been posted during the first 48 hours of the typhoon making landfall. And by the way, there were more than 100,000 tweets. To collect these and to identify which of these had links that posted to uh, linked and directed to images and video footage that captured the damage caused by the typhoon. And that's not all. In addition to that, once we actually found these images and, and videos, they wanted to know where exactly in the Philippines these images and video footage were actually shot. That makes information actionable. Oh, and by the way, they wanted this in less than 12 hours, <laughs> right? By 0500, uh, next morning, Geneva time. So we quickly turned to something called microtasking. And we used a free and open source platform called Crowdcrafting. And this is basically how it worked. A digital humanitarian volunteer would go to this particular website. She would see a tweet posted from the Philippines, click on the link to look for multimedia content relevant to this disaster operation. In this case, say, she finds two pictures clearly depicting damage. She tags them as such. And you see location. Bislik City is actually referred to in the tweet. So she also clicks on the location, which pops up a map where she can actually search for the location of that particular town, which then geotags that multimedia content. By 0500 the next morning, as our colleagues at the United Nations were waking up in Geneva, we had processed over 20,000 links with hundreds and hundreds of pictures and video footage that we had also geotagged. Our UN colleagues took this data and within an hour created this incredibly unique official UN disaster assessment map. And you're some of the first to actually see this incredible map. And the reason it's so incredible is this is the first time that an official UN crisis map is entirely composed of crowdsourced multimedia social, you know, in media information, microtasked by digital volunteers from all around the world. This is a completely new world for dis digital humanitarian response. Clearly, these micro-tasking approaches are very powerful and will become even more relevant for the future of disaster response. They help us to manage and filter this ocean of zeros and ones, this big crisis data, which is why I'm really excited this morning at TEDx Traverse City to announce the launch of micro-mappers in partnership with the United Nations. This will come out this summer, like any good movie does, and will basically allow anyone to become a digital humanitarian. Simply by having internet connection, you can directly get involved in supporting disaster response operations around the world with a simple click of the mouth. It's all you need to do. So basically, join, sign up to become a digital humanitarian on micro mappers.com. So we've got that problem sorted, right? Hopefully. What about false data? Obviously, we know that on social media, not everything that's published uh, should be believed. You may remember this tweet from just a few weeks ago. The AP account was hacked. Uh, this tweet briefly wiped out over $100 billion off the stock market. So this can definitely cause damage. And the same is true for disaster response. So how do we manage this? Well, the first thing to remember is that 
the need to verify crisis information is certainly not new, right? 911 is a crowdsourcing system that's been around for more than half a century. What these 911 operators do is they crowdsource emergency calls from the public, from the crowd. But how many of these calls are actually relevant and really emergency calls? In New York City alone, NYPD receives over 10 million false misdials or hoaxes as calls on their 911 system. Now, does that mean we should run out and abolish the 911 system? Of course not. That would be folly. We simply need to find better ways to manage this particular challenge, which brings me to the topic of balloons. A few years ago, DARPA launched a fascinating challenge. They basically quietly positioned 10 red weather balloons across the continental United States. And they put up a prize uh, money, $40,000, for the first individual or team to find the location of these 10 red weather balloons. Now, I'll give you an example. This was one of the balloons found. Now, how many days do you think it took for that winning team to find all 10 red weather balloons? Keep in mind, we're talking about the continental US, 3 million square miles. Any guesses? Say 10 days? Anybody want to say nine? One? Pretty close. Eight hours and 44 minutes to find all 10 balloons. And they did this without even leaving their rooms. Right? This was actually a team at MIT. They used social media to crowdsource the search for these 10 balloons. And they did this in eight hours and 44 minutes. This has potentially interesting applications for disaster response. And this is how they did this. Basically, they said, we're not going to keep the $40,000 to ourselves. We'll give it out to folks who help us find those 10 red weather balloons. So let's say I was part of the MIT team. I got on Twitter, and I posted this particular challenge. I said, hey, followers, I'm looking for this balloon or these 10 balloons. Help me. There is money to be won here. And they would then go to their followers and pass on the message, and so on and so forth, until one perhaps lucky chap who's walking down a park actually spots a balloon and is very happy because that person basically gets $4,000, and the person who referred them gets 2000 and back and forth up the chain. This is an incredible example of the power of crowdsourcing, of time-critical mobilization that surely has to have some kind of application and use in disaster response. In a case like Hurricane Sandy, which is, you'll remember, the worst disaster ever to hit New York City. You probably remember this footage from CNN at the time, right? Yeah, you, we all saw it, right? No, of course. This is from the day after tomorrow, a Hollywood movie, right? But what happens during disasters is you have people, for better or worse, sharing false information, knowingly or, or, or mistakenly. We saw many video footage that was, was false as well as pictures, and my favorite that was circulated at the time is this one. <laughs> all my favorite characters rolled into one, right? So you don't need an expert uh, you know, computer scientist or a detective to tell you that this is a false image, right? But what if you had seen this picture first? I paused. I certainly took me a while to think and, and, and do research on it, and it turned out to be false. But what's incredible, what's been happening over the past few years, couple years, during disasters is you have individuals, I call them good digital Samaritans, who take it upon themselves to curate and verify content during disasters. And Hurricane Sandy was no exception. These are all images that were circulating during Hurricane Sandy. The top one here was a ship that ran aground uh, in Staten Island. Now, all these individuals, there are a few of them, are working independently. They're not, they're not working together, let alone leveraging the power of the crowd. Imagine if you just had three or four individuals looking for those 10 red weather balloons. There's no way you would have found them even in weeks or months. So the power of the crowd is something we want to tap. So my colleagues and I are launching a project called uh, Verily, which will leverage this idea of very few degrees of separation between all, all of us, especially in, in disasters in urban areas, right? The degree of separation just goes even shorter, maybe one or two. So maybe a bunch of us actually know people who live on Staten Island who could have basically gone out of their apartment and taken a picture to confirm whether or not that ship was actually there, right? So what if we use the same approach that our MIT colleagues used to find those balloons, but instead of looking for balloons, let's crowdsource the search for truth. Let's crowdsource verification. That's exactly what we're doing with a platform called Verily that we'll also launch 
this summer. We'll allow all of you, all of us, to be digital detectives and to support humanitarian organizations in verifying social media content. Now, together with Verily and Micromappers, which I just talked about, these new technologies allow us to democratize disaster response, allow us, all of us, to become digital humanitarians and to have significant impact around the world, no matter where we are, on disaster response operations. So I hope you'll join us and become a digital humanitarian. Thank you very much.